morning, good afternoon, evening to all of you who have joined us today. Thank you for joining us in this webinar. And um, I am Manu Putumana, um, uh, VP Cyber Defense from Emphasis. Uh, today I am joined by uh, Mr. Sudarshan, a friend, our technology partner in Deception Services, and Chief Technology Evangelist from Smokescreen, the leading cybersecurity, cyber deception platform. Today, through this session, we are going to, uh, our attempt is to demystify cyber deception for you. With, with accelerated cyber threats that's worsening day by day across the world and mounting challenges that CISOs face in defending the organizations that they represent. We are going to look at how cyber deception as a capability or as a, or, or as a field has evolved to become a vital part of cyber defense strategy. That's what we, myself and Sudarshan, has kept as our agenda for today. Now, before we get into the technical details of it, deception is not something that humans just invented. It's very much in nature. Nature perhaps has perfected it. And it uses it for both offensive or evasive and, uh, um, uh, I mean, de defensive and uh, offensive purposes, like you can, what you see in these pictures, right? And most of you have seen all of this in history or all other channels that we watch. However, one of my favorite is this, a pack of zebras. It's an unlikely example for deception because their black and white design doesn't really camouflage them against the African backdrop. Then how does it work? It, it is not camouflaging itself against the backdrop. It is camouflaging against its, it, it, its pack of pack or herd, right? A predator, maybe a lion who is on the hunt for zebra, is always looking for the weakest one in the herd because that's the most efficient one to chase and uh, capture, just like a cyber attacker who is looking for the weakest link in the in the in the chain, right, to breach. Now, zebra's ability to be uh, applied deception is in the pack is being in the pack, where when the pack is moving in response to a hunt, it becomes difficult for the lion to keep track of which is the weakest one. And in that, so it, it changes the risk uh, involved for the uh, uh, effort and, and risk involved for the lion. Instead of weakest, if, if, it, if, it, if it ends and ends chases the strongest one, it risks itself and it has to put more effort and it even may end up without having a hunt, a lot of effort wasted, right? That's how nature deploys deception in, in this case. Now, moving into the human's world, the ancient text of art of war considered deception as a key part of warfare strategy. And so does, or, I mean, so does all modern warfare as well. And cyber defense is nothing short of a digital war. It is a digital war. And, and the, the, uh, this picture is a very good example. It, it, the benefits of uh, uh, cyber or, or, or deception as a strategy is obvious. The key thing here is for the attacker or an enemy soldier in this case, maybe a sniper sitting far away and trying to shoot these soldiers. His risks are now very high with, with so many dummies or fake heads distributed across the war, war front, right? He has to take additional equipment or maybe effort to spot the actual soldier, otherwise his, his efforts are wasted. And if you look and 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 uh, if you look at it from the defender's perspective, these dummies are, are an excellent solution. It protects his soldiers no damage to his soldiers, it's easy to deploy, it's easy to manage and operate, it's cost effective, and more importantly, just with an addition, like, like the periscope that you see in the other soldier along with this, this in, uh, in, in this picture, they can have a mechanism to monitor the sniper's activity. So when, when the at, uh, attacker fires, his position is compromised. Now you know where he is, what he's doing, what kind of rifle he carries, what its range, you are better prepared to defend against him. So that's how deception gives you a better vantage point in, 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 in this. And this is very close to how cyber deception also works. It, it, it's effective, it increases the odds against the attacker and gives you a vantage position against the attacker. Now let's take, take the story forward. 
organizations face se several cyber defense challenges, right? And that, and it's only getting worse. We started with that message. Healthcare organizations in particular are attractive targets for cyber threats just for the nature of business that they are in. The, the kind of data they process, the kind of equipments that they use, the medical devices, the lab equipments and whatnot. So they become, and, and the potential reward um, that comes out of breaching a healthcare organization. So it becomes an attractive target. So in addition to the common challenges that every other enterprise CISO faces, like the ones that you're seeing here, high volumes of security telemetry, high false positives, operational silos, low levels of automation, high cost of cyber solutions. This is all applicable to healthcare CISOs as well. In addition, they also have to deal with these special equipments or maybe non-standard equipments, which runs probably old OSs or non-standard OSs, which comes uh, like, like the lab equipments or medical devices, which comes with very limited security capabilities. Many times you cannot de deploy a, 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 a antivirus or any control onto them. And they operate in, in their environment, wide and open and vulnerable for these kind of attacks. And that and 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 cyber deception with some of its capabilities helps make an effective defense strategy. Like low volume and high confidence detections. Cyber, cyber deception offers low volume and high confidence detections. Means this is, a, this, this is about decoys or fake environments. Anybody who deals with a decoy or a fake environment is, is highly malicious. Any, any interaction with a decoy is highly malicious. Almost certainly deserve an act of malicious, with a malicious intent. And an ability to detect and deal with previously unknown attacks just like the periscope example that we took in the earlier slide you can watch or you are watching what the person with malicious intent dealing with the decoys are doing which means even if it is zero day or previously unknown attacks you know what he's doing and you can plan your defense against it and one of the very key capability which is very much useful in healthcare organizations case is an ability to emulate many of these platforms come with the emulation capability where you can emulate these medical or non-standard devices, the, the uh, lab equipments and things like that, deceiving the attacker to believe what he's seeing is a real lab equipment or a lab machine or a medical equipment and and entrapping him to deal with the deception uh, environment. Now, when, when uh, 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 most common question that I, I end up hearing when when in a conversation with, about cyber deception is are they just honey pots aren't they just honey pots the answer is yes and no maybe 15 12 years back when it all started the deception meant deploying standalone honey honeypots mostly servers or VMs placed in different parts of organizations which were predominantly on-premise. And these honeypots were expected to lure attackers or people with malicious intent or, or scripts into on, onto them, and, and which gives the organizations an opportunity to watch them. But then those were not enterprise-ready solutions. They were high-maintenance solutions. They needed high technical expertise to manage them. And they ended up being mostly used for research purposes or even as threat intel gathering machines. Most organizations and enterprises stayed away from them. But the modern deception platforms have come light years ahead from there. They are very agile where they, are, they are deploy SaaS model, they use automation, they use AI, ML, everything that you can think of at this point. And then they apply operate at multiple layers, network, endpoint, deception at network, endpoint, application data, and more. They use different techniques like decoys, like fake applications, fake machines, lures, files with passwords and credentials and things that attackers are usually interested in, honey tokens, fake credentials, and things like that. They use different techniques at different stages uh, or, or different uh, areas of the, the target network to, to implement their deception strategy. And with all this, they effectively intervene at all stages of a cyber attack kill chain 
making every step of the attacker complex. At every step, step he has to decide which is a dummy head or which is a real soldier. It turns the odds against him significantly. And in doing that, they deliver deception in depth. That's how they work, delivering deception in depth. Now, with that, I will invite Sudarshan to take us through how it works at the technology level through their platform Smokescreen. Sudarshan, over to you. Let's imagine that there is a pot of gold, something that's really important for you within your organization that you really need to protect. And there's a malicious entity that's after this pot of gold. Now, as most organizations do, they implement certain security controls. This could be in the form of firewalls, monitoring equipment like your IDS or your SIEM, and you may even have a 24 by 7 SOC. Now, most adversaries already know that these basic components of a security strategy are implemented in most organizations. And so over time, they've figured out a mechanism that allows them essentially to map out the network, how it looks, and try to find the path of least resistance where they will not be detected as it attempt to find and steal the pot of gold. And in this case, you can see that the path is available where pretty much there would be no detection. And so this is the reason why, for example, when you hear stories like Sunburst, you sit back and wonder, why is it that organizations are still getting breached today? And it's because adversaries over time have perfected this playbook. We want to mess with this playbook. And the way we are going to do that is by introducing deception. What we're going to do is we are going to place multiple fake pots of gold. The fundamental property of the fake pot of gold is that if you touch it, if you interact with it, if you move it, it will immediately generate an alarm. The alarm goes straight to the, the monitoring team and they will be able to respond quickly and cut off the attacker. Another important thing that you want to notice is, remember that the data is only being generated every time a trap is being interacted with. So the volume of data that you're collecting through deception is a fraction of what you would collect if it was any other mechanism or alternative that you're exploring. So now the adversary is completely confused. And remember now, one of the important changes that we made to the cyber defense game is the defense team has to be right only once. So what we want is the adversary needs to only interact just once with any of these pots of gold. Let's run a thought experiment and actually remove controls from the environment and see whether deception can stand on its own within an organization, regardless of the level of maturity of the security program. And the answer to that question is yes, it can. The reason is that what we're targeting is how the adversary thinks about the problem, how they want to plan their move as they are trying to navigate an environment. And so as long as they interact with the trap, we've, we've been alerted to the presence of the adversary. Now, we're not just going to throw these traps uh, randomly across the environment. We're going to plan them very strategically. Let's assume that the real part of gold is the one that's highlighted on your screen right now. You will see that there is no way or no viable path for the adversary to interact with the real part of gold without encountering a fake first. This is called deception strategy. The idea that we can disrupt the adversary playbook if we plan where and how many uh, deception are we going to place within the environment. Now, of course, I've storyboarded this uh, in a pot of gold scenario. But I think a fantastic experiment is to really just dig down deeper into what happens in real life. I have spent 
probably uh, more than a decade red teaming. For those who don't know what red teaming is, it's basically companies hired me and my team to go in and break into their organizations. And I'm playing for you a scenario of us hacking into a healthcare organization. One key point that I want everybody to take a note of if you have a pen and paper with you is when we are planning a hack against any organization, the only thing that really differs is our action on objectives. So for example, in the healthcare organization that we were working with, we had four very clear, very succinct goals. One, compromise emails of key personnel. Two, get access to patient data or PII. Three, access IoT-based health systems. They had a few of them in the environment. And the fourth one was they had a very specific application within the environment, which basically was, you know, at the time of check-in, a lot of documents were being processed through that application, and that's what we had to get access to. And so the way we started planning uh, the attack was how do we actually action on these objectives? So if you were, for example, working with any other sector, the only thing that would change is where this graph ends because the action on objectives would be no good different. Otherwise, the playbook's mostly the same. So initially, one of the things that we had to achieve was get initial access into the environment. This was done by attacking applications on the perimeter. In the last year, you might know that a lot of applications have gone online, not necessarily security tested. And if there's a vulnerability on any of those applications, what it will allow us as hackers to do is actually get a foothold into the environment. Once I've compromised that server, I now have a line of sight directly into the internal network. And that's what we did. We executed certain attacks that allowed us to compromise a very specific admin account. And what we realized was that this administrator account was all powerful. It was a member of a group called the Domain Admins Group, which in Windows environments is one of the most powerful groups that you can encounter, right? And with this level of privilege, what you could do was extract passwords for pretty much every user in the environment. Now, once you've got the passwords, it's trivial to log into people's emails. So we were able to kill off that objective right off the bat. The other crazy thing that happens if you get this level of privilege is you basically have administrator access to pretty much every single workstation and server within the environment. Just take a second and think about that. With one set of credentials, you can log in everywhere. Now, we, were, we had to map out the environment, so we did a ton of scanning trying to figure out where can we get access to patient data. And our hypothesis was, let's access the, the workstation of the person that's usually handling that data. And so we attacked an, a very specific administrator on that network. And our hypothesis was there's likely going to be stored passwords on that person's machine that will eventually allow us access to the patient data. And that's how we killed off uh, another, another goal. So we rinsed and repeated this process because we figured out that that's what's working. And on a file share, we actually found manuals and details about all the IoT systems that were there in that environment. Where are they? How do you access them? What ports, what credentials, who has access? Everything stored on a file share. It was pretty crazy. Uh, and because we had that administrative access to the file share, we could literally go through every single file and folder on that machine, found the password, boom, access into the IoT systems. And we used that same process again to compromise that health check app, that check-in application. So, the playbook that we executed was try to get higher privileges, steal credentials, look through files, scan the network, targets very specific sets of people, and then basically action on objectives. And so what we want to be able to do really is use deception to disrupt this adversary playbook. The way you can mess with a red team like mine is simply by planting fakes and you will see that most red teams will fail. And if red teams can fail, then adversaries will also fail. Now, in a healthcare context, how would you, what are some of the great use cases that you can actually implement to mess with threats that are active in healthcare organizations? 
The first one is ransomware. I've been writing a ton about ransomware. One example, it's a very small example, but an important example is you can actually detect ransomware because one of the things ransomware does is it tries to disable security and healthcare processes. So for example, if you've got healthcare equipment from General Electric, uh, you'll find that the software is running a process on the machine and the ransomware will try to stop that and we can spin up fakes of those. The second one is obviously the big concern. It's a compliance concern as well, which is uh, the compromise of patient information. And one of the really smart ways to break into patient, uh, patient databases is to attack the database administrator. So one use case that we've helped somebody implement is, hey, let's plant decoy credentials and yours towards a fake patient database. And so if an adversary lands up on uh, the database administrator's actual machine, the lures will disrupt and, and move the adversary in a different direction. And at the same time, we can actually detect their presence. We can even make it a lot simpler simply by planting files that look like they contain PII all over the network, whether it's on a real endpoint or on decoy file shares. And that will allow for interaction and detection of uh, the adversaries will interact with these file shares and we'll be able to detect them. A really interesting use case that's come up in the last year or so uh, because of infrastructure going online is pre-breach detection. So what we can do is literally plant decoy healthcare web applications. I'll show you an example of this in the demo. That can be publicly hosted on the internet and you can monitor to see what entities over the internet are actually interacting with decoy applications. It's a threat intelligence source. And it's also a correlation source where you can say, hey, if he's interacting with a decoy application, what else from my real infrastructure is he interacting with? And take an action to block off the actor before they can even action on objectives. And the last one, and this is, I, I think, a really cool thing that you can do is actually spin up decoy IoT services. Now, we know that IoT services uh, and IoT devices are in a lot of different modes and a lot of different varieties. And so one of the things that we really put a lot of effort into is how, how can you make it really simple for security folks to be able to quickly spin up uh, protocols and services of any type of any variety without too much effort. And I'm going to demonstrate one of these to you as well. So you can actually use decoy IoT devices on your network and monitor them for interaction. All of this stuff that we're talking about deception actually comes under a term uh, that organizations are starting to adopt today called active defense, right? And one of the key components of active defense is the creation of a fake attack surface. What this fake attack surface is going to allow you to do is you're gonna engage the attacker and disrupt how they op op operate within the environment. This is a shift uh, in approach from what we are doing currently, simply because right now our defenses are predictable. They are set up in a manner that the adversary can already anticipate what you might have, and they already have tool sets uh, and exploits and, uh, and approaches to be able to succeed within that organization. And so when you do these really simple, high, uh, uh, high impact, uh, valuable controls like deception to manage the attack surface within your organization with active defense, uh, it basically completely messes with them and disrupts their operation. Right now, one of the reasons why they're succeeding so much is because they are able to completely and easily manifest and operate their thinking, which is, hey, if you have X, then I'll do Y. So an example of that is, if you have a firewall, I'm just going to use whatever firewall ports you've left open in order to propagate my attack. Just an example of that if and then thinking that adversaries use. Let me talk to you about a couple more. You know, back in the day, we used to use MD5 to actually encrypt hashes, right? uh, uh, to hash our passwords, sorry, not encrypt, but hash our passwords. Uh, and now we work on a fundamental assumption that, hey, you know what? Let's assume that the adversary act will anticipate that the adversary is probably going to get access to these password hashes. And so now we're going to use bcrypt. What bcrypt does is immeasurably, immeasurably increases the cost to the adversary to be able to break a password. So it's gonna take them a lot more time. Uh, and so that's, a, that's an active defense example. Another active defense example is what we're talking about today, deception, where we are anticipating what the adversary does and actively channel them, actively engage them so that we can smoke them out and trap them and take them out of the network. 
right? There's a few more. I won't go into the details. So surely you'll get the slide deck so you can go through some of more some of these examples as well. But you know, I I work in the deception space, right? So you don't really have to take my word for it. If you've heard of the MITRE Corporation, uh, one of their most popular frameworks is the ADT and CK matrix, which uh, is a taxonomy of everything that the adversary does from an attack perspective. And so one of the problems that they are now trying to solve is what frameworks can we give defenders to effectively defend against their uh, organization? And it is they that have introduced the term active defense and the active defense matrix. So it's a counterpart to the ATT and CK called MITRE SHIELD. Please write that down, MITRE SHIELD. Google that and go through the matrix. And even if you eyeball that matrix, you will see the recurrence of the word decoy in it. And you've got now a global standards organization that's telling you decoys are essential part of a defensive program. So take uh, definitely take a look at the framework I uh, encourage you to click through each of those, uh, uh, or each of the parts of the matrix to kind of try to parse out, uh, you know, specifics of what they feel is a really good mechanism for defense within the organization. <clears throat> One of the things that I get asked very often is, hey, you know, yet another new security concept that's being thrown at me apart from all the other stuff that's happening. Uh, is it really right for me? Should I really be looking at this seriously? Let me address it at a philosophical level, which Manu also alluded to uh, when he was talking and introducing deception, is it's fundamental to strategy. A fundamental part of strategy is to be able to create that fake attack surface for effective threat detection. And so as a strategy, it's a, a must adopt strategy. Now we work with healthcare organizations that are in different, uh, you know, in different parts of their security maturity program. Some of them are just getting started and some of them pretty much have everything. If you're just getting started, this is gonna be your first line of defense. The time to value is extremely low and you will see benefits of an active defense approach and a deception-based active defense approach really quickly. For organizations further up the scale, it'll improve your capabilities uh, of detecting threats because this decoy is context. Nobody should interact with a decoy. I automatically know it's bad. And so I have something immediately to action on and not worry about false positives. And for really mature organizations, deception platforms today are so mature that they can talk to a, literally every other single platform that you already have in your stack. So you can talk to your SIM, it can talk to EDRs, and you can now get the deception advantage and make it work with your mature stack already, right? And so uh, that's something that even Smokescreen can uh, easily provide. Uh, and we have all of those capabilities out of the box. But you know what, uh, kind of enough with the talk right now, right, enough of the slides, let's really see the proof in the pudding. And I'm gonna run through a few demos about how the actually uh, the attack side looks like uh, and how we can use deception to break some of those, uh, those thinking, that thinking that adversaries uh, actually go through when they're trying to break into an organization. The first uh, use case that I wanna to talk to you about is around pre-breach detection. I hope that you can see my screen. You should be seeing a shell on your screen. Pre-breach detection uh, is the, uh, our idea is very simple. We are gonna plot decoy applications on unused subdomains for organizations. So for example, for uh, the Choice Corp, uh, you know, uh, which is a fictitious organization, we are going to create decoy applications and plant them on very specific subdomains. So when the adversary tries to figure out the pres presence of different types of uh, you know, subdomains that might be registered for a particular organization, uh, the tool will actually try to figure, uh, will brute force DNS to try to figure out what these subdomains are. For example, you might see something like UAT. Uh, UAT is a, a fantastic um, kind of motivating factor for adversaries to go after because UAT environments are not typically security tested. And so what the adversary does is copies uh, the UAT subdomain, goes into the browser, plugs that in, and is brought up an application, and this application's a fake. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a login screen available. Maybe the adversary tries to guess a, uh, uh, guess a password, but all the time in the background, telemetry is being collected, and, and we're detecting the attacker, right? So this is a great example of pre-breach detection. We do this uh, very, very specifically, where you will have to be 
called out by name, which means the adversary must configure the tool or the browser specifically with the domain name. It will uh, reject all other kinds of traffic. And so it's extremely low noise as well. Now, this is an example from the outside, an internet-based attack. What happens if, for example, the adversary lands up on a real system by phishing uh, a victim, right? And so the adversary now has access to an actual real workstation within the environment. And this is where the concept of lures and honey tokens come in. One of the really powerful things that you can do is try to understand uh, try to break how the adversary thinks when they are on an actual endpoint. One of the things that the adversary likes to do, for example, which is super simple, is look for files and credentials that may be interesting. So once they have access to a particular system, they might execute a script that allows them to enumerate interesting files on that system, and they might see something like a passwords file. And so what the adversary wants to do then is typically adversaries won't try to open the file right there. They'll try to copy it back to the infrastructure on the internet that they are controlling. So I'm going to simulate that activity of them trying to copy out a passwords file uh, for later interrogation on their own environment, right? And what I want to tell you is this password file generated by the deception platform and planted on a real endpoint, it's a fake. The same um, tactic can be used to poison uh, how the adversary thinks about gathering creden credentials from a real endpoint. So maybe the adversary wants to look at browser-based credentials. And what we'll do is that we'll actually plant fake credentials within the browser and mislead the attacker towards a decoy. So perhaps what they do is they see that there's an application for which uh, they've got a username password combination that they've found stored in the Chrome password. And so they try to log in to that, and it's a Citrix server, very commonly used uh, across multiple environments, not just healthcare. And they can go ahead and try to guess the passwords on that as well. So a couple of great examples on stuff that you can do on the endpoint. You can even do stuff like kill off security processes. There's a fake process uh, uh, feature available as well where you can spin up fake security processes for pretty much any security vendor. So now enough about the endpoint, let's think about something else that the adversary does, which uh, is talk to Active Directory. Most environments run Active Directory. This particular attack that I'm going to demonstrate to you, if you've not seen it before, uh, congratulations. This is going to be the first time you're going to see an actual attack that was used in the sunburst attack. Uh, this was uh, an attack called Kerber Roasting, which specifically targets really critical accounts in Active Directory and makes them reveal password hashes. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Uh, and so you can see that, uh, you know, immediately on your screen that there's a, there's a password hash. What adversaries do is they copy out this hash and they try to crack it. And if they are successful in cracking it, they get access to a pretty critical account. What we've done is we've planted fake users that are vulnerable to this. And the moment this attack is actually being executed, you can actually detect this attack. So if, for example, you already had deception implemented in your environment, you actually might have detected sunburst, whereas nobody else actually even had a clue that something like this was going on. Really simple, really powerful. And now let's take it to the last part, which is trying to find systems on the network, right? And one of the most unavoidable parts of the attacker's playbook is to scan the environment. Without scanning, you cannot discover. And so I'm gonna actually kick off a scan and I'm gonna tell you something very interesting about scans and how deception is superb for catching scans. When you have decoys planted on the network, even if a single packet goes towards a decoy, it generates the alarm, right? And the only way the attacker can actually discover a system is if they scan the network. So that means they have to send packets. It's a zero sum game. We are going to win this game, right? When the sports scan is happening, all the telemetry is being collected on the decoy. Some of the systems that you're seeing on your screen are real. Some of them are fake. One of the things that I've configured the scan to do is specifically also look for IoT devices. This particular IoT device runs on a very specific port 
port 2323 and we have already discovered that port is open on a network and you can see that the host name over there says something like hr monitor i'll show you what that is in a second but a really interesting thing that you can do with this this by the way is a technique that's used by ransomware to also dis uh, discover file shares on the network so you can actually plant fake file shares so if I was, for example, to look at, hey, look, an app, uh, something that has a, a folder called app backup, I definitely want to look at that. When I open that up, you will see that there's information about, for example, Nessus vulnerability scans, really important for adversaries, shortcut to try to figure out what vulnerabilities there are in the environment. But this is a decoy file share. Every single file on this file share is a fake, and it's all been automatically generated by the platform. Great for ransomware detection, great for lowering the attacker towards uh, a decoy and, and basically trapping the adversary at this point. But now let's quickly go back to that HR monitor because I'm, um, because right now I, I'm really, really interested in basically looking at this specific uh, IoT device. Okay, port, uh, that's running on port 2323. So let me just clear the screen and What I'm going to try to do is connect on port 2323 to this IP address. And boom, I've actually got access to a heart rate monitor. I want to figure out what commands I want to run on this. Maybe first I want to try to log in. Okay, it's not accepting that. Not accepting that. Maybe I check the status. Okay, so this device is due for replacement on uh, in 2024. But I want to give you an idea of just how powerful this is. It looks like it's a heart rate monitor. It's an IoT device, it's a decoy, and it's been completely spun up by the platform itself, right? And you don't have to learn how to code to build something like this. Superb and very powerful for healthcare organizations. Now, sure, we've been running all these attacks and I've pointed out decoys in each of these different phases, but let's actually see how that looks on, a, on the platform itself. So one of the cool things that you can do with the, with the Smokescreen platform uh, is in the last 10 minutes, uh, which is where I've been running the demo, you can literally just replay everything that happened uh, in, in near real time. So every interaction that we had with decoys has been recorded. But it's not just that. We've got a system that with a single click, it, it pops out a panel and you can see something here called thread parse. And what thread parse actually does is rather than you having to pass through really complex log lines, actually will reconstruct those log lines in plain and simple in English. So an interaction with the heart rate monitor has been detected. The fact that we accessed file shares has been detected. The fact that we tried to uh, use an administrator account to log in has been detected. Let's take a look at, for example, the uh, attack that was used in Sunburst and how we have actually passed that out. So the curb roasting attack, what exactly is it? Right, uh, this is really helpful for analysts to quickly parse exactly what happened. How do you actually mitigate an attack like this? And just so that you don't have to parse through, uh, you know, comprehensive log lines, uh, we've just, uh, you know, presented the most important pieces of the log line for you to be able to quickly analyze. Right now, the last thing is about how do you make it work with your existing security stack. This is available right out of the box. So for example, you can send a signal out to uh, a firewall, you can send it, send it out to an EDR, you can send it out to an AB. Uh, and what will happen is this signal will go to this other device that you already have. It can even go to your SIEM, by the way, and it will automatically contain the host from which this attack is originating. So from the time you actually detect to the time you understand what's happening to the time you respond, the amount of time you spend is reduced and which is basically the goal of any cybersecurity defense program. That's what I really had for you today. Uh, I'm going to pass on uh, the control back to Manu now. Uh, and really thanks for, uh, for taking the time to uh, you know, go through this demo. Manu, over to you. So finally, we are at the conclusion. So I hope this, this has given you a good overview of what deception and what it does. Now, uh, in, 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 in summary, what I wanted to say is in when, when it, when it comes to an attacker's perspective and an environment without deception is like the first, uh, dice that you're seeing here. 
it's like a dice roll and and this dice has the same number number of his choice on all its side in whichever he he rolls he gets the desired outcome whereas when it in an in in a in a environment with deception with all these decoys placed at each phase of the attack kill chain and that is that to different kinds of decoys serving to different purposes as as we mentioned earlier the 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 decoys or the honey pods or the lures like the passwords uh, decoys an an example that um uh, sudarshan showed is the ge application while it looked very genuine the, it was a fake application and there is no way an attacker when he looks through from an out, outside as a part of his recon activity he is very likely to believe that this is a, a genuine application accidentally exposed and 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 uh, the 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 deception strategy is what drives into effectively deciding what are the fake items that you place and where do you place it and then um um when and at, the, at at each stage then if it is about the password files that sudarshan showed or or the curb roasting uh, method uh, how how he has faked that as well right so at each phase of the attack by deploying deception different kinds of methodologies it intervenes at each deception stage making each step difficult so the role of the dice changes from a dice with the same number of his choice on all sides to really a, a a game i mean very simplistically a game of probability in fact it is more it, more difficult than that if you put an effective deception strategy now as you can see here in the second picture if 6 six by 6 six is the desired outcome of a breach with all the other possibilities in 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 this dice roll in a two stage deception the pro, pro, uh, you know the chance of the, uh, uh, actual breach comes down significantly and one important aspect one key aspect is every other possibility other than 6 by six, uh, uh, both dice rolling into 6 everything else every other chance that he rolls he exposes himself he makes his presence felt and exposes himself in the deception platform allowing the organization to know where he is who he is and how what he is trying to do right and while this this uh, um uh, uh, diagram doesn't show it exact uh, explicitly uh, so there's an also alluded to the fact that the gold pot which is a crown jewel that we are trying to protect can be placed in a way that it cannot be reached or it won't be reached without at least one deception platform being uh, stepped right so thereby making the chances of reaching the uh, breaching the uh, decoys or deception platform uh, chances of uh, reducing the chance of breaching now uh, th that that's pretty much what we wanted to cover today and um, uh, now now i think we can open the conversation for any q and a uh, um, any questions that you might have i am unable to see the the webex my webex is hung so if there are questions if if um, uh, it can be read out i'll i'll answer that myself and sudarsh will answer that are there any questions i see a question that says uh, does the solution need to have individual vms for each installation um we operate a slightly different architecture um basically uh, the platform is cloud delivered uh, and the architecture does not require you to have basically individual vms for basically my, my assumption is every single decoy uh, rather the architecture is slightly different that allows you to have basically just one single vm a uh, very lightweight couple of gigs of ram uh, and about 50 gigs of hard disk space uh, in one side and that one small vm alone uh, can spin up uh, you know as many decoys as you can possibly uh, require in that given site so we think about it more in terms of sites rather than in terms of the number of decoys uh, because we are able to scale out decoys because the the it's completely backed by uh, a saas based platform 
Yeah, I will just add on to that. So uh, referring back to one of the earlier points that I mentioned, um, before advanced deception platforms came into existence, deploying honeypots or decoys meant you will spin up individual VMs or hardware based bare metal machines at di different parts of your environment and install the OS on it and other honeypot, the, the so uh, software required to set up the honeypot. But then, as I mentioned, the deception platforms have evolved, I mean, have come light years ahead. They are uh, the most of these fake applications or machines that you uh, saw as fake in Sudarshan's demo, they don't really exist in your machine. They are just decoys. They are not running in separate machine. There is a core network decoy which runs these simulations rest and and there are for for endpoint uh, endpoint the the lures the password files exist in your actual or targeted endpoint machines where actually your users are working so if they are compromised and the attacker searches their machines for um, probably credentials and they will come across these lures when it comes to applications and machines these are uh, virtual means not standalone vms they are all emulations running within a, a, a VM on which the, the platform would run. So it uh, so it, to answer this in a different from a different perspective, one of the questions that we often hear is when you deploy this, how much is my inventory cost going up? How many more machines are you adding? Or is my cloud subscription cost going up because you are going to deploy so many additional decoy machines in my network? No, we are not for site as Sudarshan said per site one machine which which runs this uh, platform engine which emulates all of this for you so very minimal or negligible increment to your subscription costs and uh, inventory costs inventories any other questions in the chat Ho hope that answers the question any other questions okay so as as the I, I, if if there are no questions, one another um, thing we would like to uh, tell you is many of you may be hearing about deception for the first time. Some of you may be actively considering it. Some of you may not have considered it at all. One of the things that we have invariably noticed is the third bullet that we mentioned. Organizations who have looked at a proof of value a demo, which we organize for them have really understood the value, the price to value that deception platform brings and, and the significant uh, force multiplier it is in your defense strategy. Almost 95% of them, uh, you know, uh, pr progressed to uh, adopt deception as a part of their cyber defense strategy. Um, with that said, I think there are only three minutes. I hand it over back. If there are no more questions, I hand it over back to the organizer. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. I think we have three minutes. We can go ahead and close off today's call. Again, thank you everyone for joining um, and we'll go ahead and close today's session. Thank you everyone.